to be a part of global aquaculture to help accelerate operations. You know, even if people are growing algae in their operation and it's not um, and it's not enough algae, they can use ours to supplement what they're feeding to their animals. Or they can replace it 100%. There are people growing the, the Virginia oyster, the Crassostra, Cras, Crassostria virginica, and there are some hatcheries that are using nothing but our algae. Oh, and by the way, the algae is not alive. It's, it's dead. And so we grow multiple species. Some of them can be frozen, some can be refrigerated. And basically the, the person at the farm thaws it out, feeds it to their animals as needed. Uh, and so it's really, it's been really useful for people with large operations to be able to buy a bunch of frozen algae, put it in a chest freezer at their facility and use it up within a year or two years. Some of these species can be frozen for two to three years and still be a whole cell when you thaw that package, that cell, those cells are still whole and intact, and all that nutrition that was in there is ready to be consumed and assimilated. So, so that's you know that it, it's just been amazing. And what I, I thought I'd seen it all when I was in my aquaculture career, and when I came to read mariculture, I was blown away. I mean, it just it, it reminded me of how civilizations build on each other. There's just pipes everywhere. It's you know cords and harvesters and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and it's a sprawling facility where all natural sunlight, greenhouses. Um, we use a cooling tower to keep the ponds cool in the summer. Um, we open the shade cloths in the winter to let more sunlight in. Um, we don't use any artificial light. Um, we're on about 40 acres and we're over 3 million gallons of phytoplankton. I mean, this is, it's, it's unlike anything you would ever see. I mean, it's one thing to grow phytoplankton in a laboratory or in a small facility on some shelves. And it's a whole other uh, thing to scale up to the size that we're at. So this gives you an idea of, of what we bring to the plate. I'm just gonna go through this real quick. So this is Nanochloropsis. This is a genus of algae, very popular. It's a green algae, very small. Um, we call this product Nano 3600. That 3600 basically means that this one liter bottle is equivalent to 3,600 liters, which is almost a thousand gallons of live algae at 100 million cells per milliliter. So instead of growing a thousand gallons of algae, you can just buy this bottle and get it here. Um, and so that's that's how concentrated our products are. You, the way we harvest it, it's proprietary. I can't, I can't bring it up, but there are people that use our technique, our method. Um, so the way we harvest it is we concentrate the cells. We try to exclude all of the growing media. And then from there, we put it in our, our proprietary uh, formula and we package it. And, and so we are able to concentrate it down to many billion cells per milliliter, per cubic centimeter. So there are 68 billion cells per milliliter in that product. You cannot achieve that with a live algae culture. It's impossible. So we'll talk a little bit about, let's say you're an oyster farmer and you know you are somebody who wants to get into oysters and, and you're looking at, you know, what, what do oysters eat? What do I need to do to grow oysters? Because these are some of our customers. And so oysters, you know, there's all kinds of papers. You can go to Google Scholar and find tons of papers on this subject. Um, this is just one I randomly plucked um, because these guys went out and looked at, at the Crassostria gigas and they looked at them in, the nat in nature. They did surveys over the whole year and they found that these animals were consuming uh, diatoms for some of the year. They were consuming um, di dinoflagellates at, at some times of the year, other, other species of phytoplankton. Um, and so, you know, these, these, this kind of work is really helpful because then it helps us figure out, you know, what, what, what's required, what's appropriate to feed to these animals in an aquaculture setting. Uh, and so thank, thankfully all this research, a lot of this research, research has been done by, by, you know, people that are just working in aquaculture and people that are studying it and researching it. Uh, and so we were able to, to kind of dwindle it down to some of the species that are really appropriate, really required to grow bivalves, shellfish, feed the life feed organisms, things like that. So here is, this is from Cornell. Uh, they're, you know, they're up in New York. Uh, this is their cooperative extension marine program, which is in Ithaca. Um, and so here you can see, these are, these are um, oyster larvae. Uh, each, so this is on a Sedgwick Raptor counting chamber. So that square that you see, those, those lines, that's a millimeter, uh, that's a millimeter uh, square. Uh, and so a millimeter is the size of basically a mustard seed, a mosquito egg, a sewing needle tip. So that little square is, is equivalent to those size things. So you can see how small these, these animals are uh, when they're you know very young, still eight days old. Um, and then you can see here that you know they're starting to mature, umbinate. I think that that means having rounded or convex form. Uh, and you know, it's, you know starting to look like they should in 13 days. They start getting an eye spot. They get that little foot 
so that they can kind of crawl around and then they figure out where they want to set and then they set, they settle down. And they put in these little shell chips into their into their uh, bats and get, you know, put them in there with the larvae and then they start moving around and they finally settle down and then they start growing into a proper oyster. Again, you can see here that some of them have already settled and others are still kind of kind of searching around for that sweet spot to, to settle down. But then once they set, yeah, then you know, then you can move on. So it's kind of neat. And then yeah, here's here's the end product. Those are those are some huge oysters. Um, this is Taylor Shellfish Farms. They're up in uh, Washington State. Uh, they're one of our customers. They feed our phytoplankton to their oysters. And then you know, then there's the oysters on the plate at the restaurant, and and you know, you complete the cycle, so to speak. Okay, so let's get into phytoplankton. Okay, phytoplankton, what is it? Well, you know, we also call it microalgae. These are microscopic plants, essentially. Uh, phyto, or, uh, plankton, uh, phytoplankton mean, meaning drifting plants, because plankton in Latin means drift, or drifting, wandering. Um, there are over 100,000 species of phytoplankton. I, I didn't even know that. I looked that up recently, and I was just blown away by that. Um, considering that we only we use a, a tiny fraction of what's available in nature. Um, and you know, there's phytoplankton in virtually every aquatic environment. They are the first trophic level. They are the primary producers. These these things produce things like fatty acids, vitamins, carotenoids. These things that animals cannot synthesize. Uh, and so that's why they are a great food source for animals that consume them. And we'll talk about the animals that consume them. And thankfully, we've had phycologists. So phyco phycology is the study of phytoplankton. And so. There have been a handful of phycologists over the centuries, over the decades, that uh, loved this subject and really focused in on it and helped to identify phytoplankton, and helped to uh, disassemble these cells and figure out what's inside, what makes them tick. Uh, and so we're very thankful to those, to those folks that did all of this work for us. And, and working with a phycologist was quite interesting. It's just amazing what these guys know about algae. <laughs> Um, and then you can see here, this is kind of, you know, it gives you an idea of, you know, where the primary producers are as far as what eats what out in the ocean. And so, you know, they're at the bottom and, you know, herbivores and zooplankton and filter feeders eat the phytoplankton and, you know, other things eat them and so on. And you work your way up to your apex predators. Um, and so there's, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of important aspects uh, of phytoplankton that uh, you know, they provide in nature. Phytoplankton also gives us a lot of oxygen. A lot of the oxygen you're breathing right now comes from phytoplankton in the ocean, not just our terrestrial plants. So this is this is a great little slide to kind of give you an idea of size of things. And so when I talk about micron, this will help you to kind of get an idea of when I speak in micron. A micron, there are one million microns in a in a meter. And so Bacteria are, are, are going to be bigger or, or about the same size as the phytoplankton we're talking about. Blood cells are larger than these things. Uh, smoke particles, white blood cells, you know, the limit of, of visibility, which is about 40 micron. That's about what the naked eye can see. Uh, and then you, you know, you get into So uh, we use a microscope at, at our job. We look into microscopes routinely. Sometimes they make me crazy and turn me into a skeleton. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this is this is kind of uh, necessary in our in our job to look at the phytoplankton, see how it looks, to see if there are any contaminants. Um, if it's motile, is it swimming properly? Does it have a flagellum? Uh, you know, things like that. So we use a cytometer. Um, this is similar equipment that people use that look at blood. Um, there are filter counters where you can put the sample in, just like people look at blood cells, and you can look at algae cells and count them that way. Uh, so you know, you need a, a, a high magnification microscope to do this work, and it's a very, a very powerful tool if you're ever going to grow phytoplankton. Is to have a microscope. Okay, so nutritional profile. So phytoplankton, you know, we talk all we always talk about lipids and proteins and carotenoid sterols, all these things that uh, are in phytoplankton, um, and and these are all you know really good sources of nutrition. DHA is something that a lot of people uh, bring up. Uh, docosa hexanoic acid. That's in some molecular structure there. Um, that's that's very popular. That's, that's very in, um, needed by people in in marine aquaculture. Uh, this omega-3 fatty acid is very important for a lot of things, uh, brain development, uh, mucus development, uh, all kinds of other, other things um, are, are helpful, or are, are uh, um, processed with DHA. And then, you know, these, these things, they, these, the, the phytoplankton, they produce proteins, carotenoids, which give them the pigmentation, uh, sterols, like cholesterol, 
uh, carbohydrates and vitamins. Um, and, and a lot of these things are incredibly unique per species of algae. So as far as like the DHA, omega-3 fatty acids, um, they're important for like reproductive health, health, nervous system function, cardiovascular function, hair and skin and you know, and mammals, immune system and so on. So, so getting DHA into your marine organisms is a very good thing for, for a lot of those reasons. Okay, so we'll, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the algae species. Um, so this is, this is Thalassia syros pseudonana. This is a diatom. Diatoms are very common in nature. This is one that was collected in, in a variety of areas, North Pacific, Mediterranean Sea, North Atlantic, Indian Ocean. Pretty much, this species is pretty much found in a lot of places uh, on the globe. You can almost call it a cosmopolitan species. Um, and, and so this, this is an excellent food for bivalves uh, from larval to broodstock. Um, it's high in, in the fatty acid, omega-3 fatty acid, EPA, and it's also got a, D, a good DHA uh, profile. Um, it's just a really weird looking thing. You know, it's like a barrel uh, or, a, or a hat. They call it a, like a, a hat box. And, and, you know, depending on how you look at it, it looks round or like, you know, like that hat box thing. This is only about, uh, these guys are only about uh, five to seven microns in size. Um, and this, this is one of the smallest diatoms that we know of that we have. And then you get into Ty Tisochrysis lutea. So this is another very popular uh, golden brown algae that's used in aquaculture. Uh, people use this in bivalve aquaculture, shrimp aquaculture, uh, growing live feed organisms like copepods. They do really well on this, on this uh, uh, species of algae. Uh, this was collected in Tahiti. Um, that's kind of why it's called it. They changed it to Tisochrysis, Tisochrysis because it used to be Tahitian isocrisis, and then the taxonomist says, let's just put the T there and quit doing that. Um, and so that's where this was uh, discovered and isolated. Oh, I also have these CCMP numbers on here. This, there's, a, there's a place in, I think it's Connecticut, um, that has, it's like a bank of phytoplankton. It's like a seed bank, kind of thing, uh, where they have phytoplankton, single species strains that are AZ and completely clean, and they sell algae to people all over the world. Um, and so if anything catastrophic happens to our facility, we can rely on them as our backup. Uh, and so we, um, they, they just asked us you know, to, to put their, their number on there. And you go to their website, you type that in, and that'll tell you where that species of algae was from. If it's difficult to culture, you know, what are its proclivities? What are its needs in, uh, in culture? So you get a lot of information from, from these folks. I think I have the website listed somewhere on here. And then we get into Nanochloropsis oculata. This is one of the most common ones. This is what a lot of people, when they start growing algae, they'll, they'll play around with this one because it's very hardy, very easy to grow, and, and tends to avoid contamination. Even if you get other algae in there, it tends to just box them out. They can't compete with this one. Uh, this one is, this is the smallest one we work with. This is one to two micron, so incredibly small, way smaller than blood cells, things like that. Um, and, and so, and this one is non-motile. So if you look at it under a microscope, a live, a, live algae, a live cell versus a dead cell, you wouldn't really know the difference because there's no motility. Uh, um, it's just not moving. Some of the algae do have motility, like the, the T. isocrisis. They can actually move around. They have little uh, flagella. And this one, Tetracelmus, this one has, uh, I think, four flagella and can swim very fast in the water. It actually corkscrews. So if you look at it under a microscope, it's actually remarkable to see it. Um, this one is widely used by shrimp farmers. It, it helps to present, uh, prevent zoea syndrome in larval shrimp, uh, which is a, something that's been, that, that plagues shrimp hatcheries, and we're talking food shrimp. Um, great for bivalve larvae past day seven, because this is a actually large algae compared to all the other ones we work with. This one measures about 10 to 12 microns. Um, and and uh, it's great for green water as well. So people working with larval fish and fish hatcheries will, will put this in their larval rearing tank because not only will the live feed organism eat it that's in that tank with the fish larvae, the fish larvae will also eat it and gain nutrition from the phytoplankton. Um, and so this is, this is one that, this is like, a lot of people call this the miracle phyto. It just has a lot of properties that are very interesting that result in, that have very unique results in aquaculture. Um, it also has a compound called taurine, which has been found to be very useful when raising larval kin fish. And then you look here, this is something that we do. We provide blends of species because there are shellfish growers and shrimp people that would like to throw everything at their end. You know, let's just take all the algae that are good for them and, and combine them. And so people said, just do that for us. And so we did. So this is, this is our shellfish diet formula. And you can see here, it's just got all the cells all jumbled together. And 
And as you can see, you know, these cells are not alive, but they're not all broken up and destroyed. You know, we, the way we harvest them is, is that the cells do not get damaged. There's no lysing of the cells. They don't auto digest themselves. There's no enzymatic action. Um, the cells are basically, they're dead, but they're not decomposing. Um, and so all that nutrition, all those things are still locked inside of the cell. And in fact, these cells can be used in freshwater aquaculture because they're not alive anymore. So there's no osmotic issues. There won't be any, um, you know, it, you know, a quick um, osmotic shock that causes the cell to literally explode. Um, and so since the algae isn't alive, you don't, you don't have to worry about that. The other thing that our, the people that buy from us love is that the algae is contamination free. It's not live anymore and, and we freeze it. And that essentially takes care of all the contaminants. Um, and so, so we actually get our algae uh, certified. We get it tested uh, because some nations require it. Uh, we sell it to Australia and they require a phytosanitary thing where it's a certificate. There's no shrimp diseases in this algae. There's no uh, coliform, things like that, that they're very interested in. So we get it all tested before we send it out. Okay, phytoplankton consumers, important to you know us here and, and to people in aquaculture. And these are just, you know, there are many things that are under these different headings. Bivalves, you know, consist of oysters and clams and, and uh, you know, mussels and things like that. So there are people that are using phytoplankton in those sectors. You know, we get sponges and tunicus in our aquariums. Those things love to eat phytoplankton. Um, shrimp larvae do really well with phytoplankton. Food fish, shrimp larvae. Um, I'm sure that marine ornamental shrimp larvae would benefit. Uh, zooplankton, you know, you can culture rotifers, copepods, amphipods, isopods, all these life feed organisms with, uh, with phytoplankton. Corals, corals, non-photosynthetic corals, gorgonians, things like that, will benefit from phytoplankton as a food source. Uh, worms, uh, like a feather duster worm, you know, they, they do really well with phytoplankton feeds. Uh, and then, of course, larval fish. There are some larval fish that will consume phytoplankton. Um, so, so yeah, th there's just there's a lot that can be done with phyto, and, and hopefully, you know, some of this inspires people in this room to kind of take on some of these things. Okay, so now we're going to do a little fun, a little Pictionary. So that's an oar and that's a foot. Can anybody tell me the Latin equivalent to that? It's my next subject. It's a copepod. The word copepod in Latin means oar foot. So, I don't know, these people come up with these things, whatever. It doesn't look like an oar to me, but, but uh, and then pod means foot. So, you know, there's people that, you know, say, yeah, stop using the word pod because there's so many different pods in the, you know, out there, you know, and, so we're just, I'm going to continue to use that sentence. Sorry. Okay, so we'll dive right into copepod. So I really like working with these animals. Um, in fact, I you know, named one of my I named one of my kids that one. Um, so this is this is just a meme that a friend of mine, Gordon Green, they came up with. And it kind of testifies to my love of these animals, and um, just I just I love growing them. I love talking about them. I love inspiring people to work with them. In uh, a lot of collectors, a lot of I got things like that. Um, and you know, I obsess over these animals. It's, you know, I have to look at the cultures every day. Sometimes it drives me crazy. It turns me into a caveman. <laughs> no, I like to dress up for Halloween. You know, and then and, and, and I'm emotionally linked to my cultures, like some people I know that are in this business. You know, things are going good. I'm stoked. You know, feel, feeling good. And you know, when they're not, I'm I'm bummed. I'm mad. So, you know, it's it's the nature of working with living things, um, as you all know. Yes. You can only do so much and, and life just throws curveballs at you. And you just gotta be able to deal with it. So hopefully you can predict it, but sometimes you just have to. Um, yeah, even my wife took my my infant son's feet and turned them into copa pots. <laughs> and, and so and she even went went along with the madness. Um, and so, so yeah, they were pretty cool. I told her, I was like, yeah, we can sell you. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, it's just whatever. So yeah, I, I, have, I have tons of these memes. I can do these all day. Um, but I'll spare you the torture. So, um, so now that we got that out of the way, so um, copepods, we'll, we'll just talk a little bit about copepods in general. So the subphylum crustacea, so a lot of you are familiar with that word, crustaceans. You know, this is this huge group of lobsters and shrimp, and crabs, uh, amphipods, isopods, krill, um, a lot of different things fall under this subphylum, including copepods. And, uh, and so, you know, they're, they're, these are interesting animals. They're one of the most abundant animals on the planet uh, next to Worms, maybe worms are worms. Um, they're found in every freshwater and saltwater habitat. These things are even found in mountains. They're found in bromeliads. 
in, in rainforests. They're found in puddles in, in deciduous forests. It, it's just remarkable where, where they can be found. Um, they, have, they have multiple life stages. They molt like lobsters and shrimp. You know, if you've ever, if you have clinker shrimp, you see them molt in your aquarium. Copepods also molt. Um, some are free living while many are parasitic. We only work with the free living ones, obviously. Um, a, a famous parasitic copepod that um, a lot of people are familiar with is the Greenland shark. Uh, it has a copepod that attaches to the Greenland shark's eyeball, um, which is just a bizarre thing. And this copepod is massive. Um, and it just attaches itself to the eyeball and the Greenland shark just goes about its business. Um, while other parasites, there are even coral parasites, uh, copepods that will, um, are parasitic to copepods, or to corals which can be a little scary, so dip your corals. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, copepods are phytoplankton consumers if they're free living. Uh, they're, a, they're a vastly important food source for numerous animals out in these aquatic habitats. Um, and, and now, thank God, they're commonly used in aquaculture. It's, it's awesome. There are way more people now culturing copepods than there were 25 years ago uh, because they, they're, they're better educated. They're, they're taught how to, how to do these things. A lot of these people are better at growing algae, which is fed to the copepods. And so, and some people go to school to specifically learn how to culture live bees. There's, there are schools that you can you know, learn these things specifically. You don't have to take a whole bunch of other stuff, um, other courses. So, so it's just, a, it's, a, it's a, a really cool animal in many ways. And then here, um, I'm just gonna go over some of these things. So the Harpacticoid copepods, that's you know, your ticker pods. These are mostly, mostly uh, Coastal creatures, uh, they live in uh, tide pools and coastal zones and in splash pools, things like that. And uh, then there's the calanoid copepods, which are open ocean. They're out in the ocean, just drifting around part of the, the plankton soup. Um, and one that we work with is part of calanoid scratchers. And then the cyclopoid copepods, which they're, they're pretty much everywhere on every continent. Um, and they, there's freshwater varieties, there's estuary varieties, there's full salt water. We work with Aphocyclops canamensis, which has um, populations in freshwater zones, estuaries, and in full strength, full salinity saltwater areas. Very, um, very common throughout the Gulf of Mexico. There's actually, uh, Aphocyclops canamensis is actually in the Everglades too. You can, you can find <laughs> and then you see here, here's all the other orders in, in, of, of copepods, and the, the rest of them are pretty much parasites. So here's the uh, developmental stuff. Um, you know, you can see here that, this, so this is like a calanoid developmental stage thing. So the calanoid copepods basically broadcast their eggs. Kind of like uh, a yellow tank versus like a clown, <coughs> like a clownfish which lays eggs. Um, so these guys broadcast their eggs into the water column. The eggs um, are, I think they're negatively buoyant. So they tend to sink and they hatch. Then you get multiple stages of larval copepod before you, before they go through metamorphosis and they reach their juvenile stages and then become an adult. Typically the females are larger because you know, they gotta have room to carry the eggs um, and, and they live longer. The males, once, once a male reaches full maturity, they don't wanna go through any more molting. Um, they don't really eat anything. They're just there to reproduce with the females and then they, they fade away. And so see, these are some of the common ones in aquaculture. Um, there are tons more. Um, and, and so these are just some of the ones I discovered and you, know, you kind of get the sizes of the knobs and the adults, and you can see here the nauplii sizes are, are very small compared to the adult sizes, and that's something that people in fin fish aquaculture really pay attention to. So this is uh, Tigriopus californicus. These are some of my own images. That's the female on the left. You can see that egg cluster, which is attached to her, her urogenital segment. And so she just uh, keep, continues to pump out eggs uh, that she fertilizes uh, with the sperm that she stores in her body and then the embryos mature and they hatch right off of those little clusters. The male there on the, on the right, you can see the male has a modified antennae, these little hooks, and they use those hooks to latch on to the females before they go through their final molt. While they're soft, they mate, they reproduce, and then that's it, the female's good. She doesn't need another mating appearance after that. Um, and then the male just you know, keeps finding females. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of something that, you know, I, I do my best to encourage in my culture is reproduction. So. When I see egg masses like that on females, that makes me happy. This is Anoplia, uh, Anoplius of, of the Tigriopus californicus. Uh, this is just a close-up. They look nothing like the adult, which is pretty remarkable. These guys like to mill around in the substrate in the mulm and, and eat organic waste and anything that sinks to the bottom of the system. Tigriopus californicus uses in aquaculture. A lot of seahorse sea people like to use them, but you gotta be careful how you use them with seahorses because 
they tend to crawl on surfaces, crawl on things, and they might crawl on your seahorses and give them a little bit of stress, but, but it's, you know, it's not too bad. And then the hobby, you know, feeding sensitive animals like mandarins, pikefish, seahorses that we have in our aquariums, and culturing for personal use. It's really cool that, you know, uh, the average hobbyist that really knows nothing about this can culture copepods and, and learn more about them. You, know, you can enrich your life. Um, so the culture diet, I feed them phytoplankton, uh, and then, you know, as the culture progresses, they get you know, a lot of waste, organic debris, very hardy, 21 to 30 days of sexual maturity. It's all temperature and food driven. Um, they're urihaline, so they can tolerate a wide range of salinities, urethermic, wide range of, of uh, temperatures, um, and, uh, and, and sexual maturity um, is once it's reached, they're done molting, they're done growing. And then nutritional profile, they're chock full of carotenoids, that's what gives them that color. Uh, fatty acids and enzymes, all the stuff they get from the bottom. Here's another one that I work with, Apocyclops panamensis. We call these apex pods. This is, a, this is the cyclopoid now. You can see here the female carries her egg masses uh, on, on each side. So there's two of them uh, instead of one. Um, and so this is anopheus. This is like a stage two or three. And then this is an older nucleus, it's like stage four or five or six, right before they're going to go through metamorphosis. And you can even see the fecal pellet in there. Um, it's, speaking of feces, <laughs> so copepods actually produce a sheath around their, their poo because their primary diet in nature is diatoms. And diatoms have these little silica spines, these little spicular things. And to prevent those spines from destroying their digestive system, they create, I, it's like a myelin sheath or something. They, they create a sheath, they, they like, it's like a sausage. It's like an extruded sausage. And it's, it's coated with this sheath, so it slides right out of them really easy. And it and, and doesn't destroy them. And then that poo will, is natively buoyant. It sinks to the bottom of the ocean and, and you know, fertilizes the ocean, so to speak. So. so there's a lot of that going on in the ocean. You know, if you swam in the ocean and take it in your mouth, you probably ate some cocoa pot. <laughs> So, and then this is, this is the third one that I work with. This is the Kalanoids um, copepod. Uh, I got this one from Karen Britton out in Hawaii. It was collected off of Oahu. Uh, she's a very famous breeder out there um, and a good friend of mine. And, and I called her up many years ago and I was like, I need this copepod. I want to make it available to people in the US, to people that want to you know, work with more difficult fish like yellow tangs. Um, and so this is, a, this is a nauplius, very small. And that's an egg. Um, these are all uh, photos that my good friend Jim Welsh took. Very good guy, really was smart and knew a lot of stuff about this. So uh, uses in aquaculture, this, this species is used in food fish aquaculture, and, as well as marine ornamentals. And what aquaculturists love about this animal is the size of that nauplia, that, that this animal right here is, is small enough that it can fit in the mouth of these small larvae. And these larvae, like yellow tang larvae, are tiny. You wouldn't even believe how small they are. I mean, they're like the size of your smallest eyelash. And so you can imagine that an animal like that, when it starts to feed, has a very small mouth and it can only eat certain size things. And that's where copepods fall. Um, and, and also copepods contain, contain digestive enzymes. So these, these larval fish that have this rudimentary gut, this animal helps the, the fish digest itself, so to speak. And so, um, so while the gut is improving and, and and growing, um, you know, there's, there's digestibility um, positives about this animal when it's consumed. And then again, this one, phytoplankton, we, we only feed this one live phytoplankton, it's kind of picky. Uh, when it comes to phytoplankton, we don't know why, what's going on. It, it maybe can taste, manipulate, I don't know, because live algae, you know, has things going on in the cell surface. And so we're trying to work on fooling this animal into eating dead algae. I don't know what the heck is going on. Um, and, and so we're looking to create a domesticated strain that only eats dead algae. So you know, we start off with a thousand of them and maybe five of them live and reproduce. That's, there you go, that's what we needed. Selective breeding, so to speak. Um, and these guys grow really fast. So five to seven days of sexual maturity, pumping out babies, and then after about 20 days, the female dies. So here's, a, I'm gonna get into a little bit about sec the sexual, uh, Dimorphism, this is the, the Apocyclops panamensis. You can see the female is there on the left, very kind of smooth, uh, continuous antennae with the little you know, hairs on there, and that's you know, what they use to, 
pick up on currents and predators so they can evade predators, things like that. And then you can see here the male has the, like articulations. It's like he's got wrists and elbows and these little you know hooks at the end. And they have mod they have developed that to you know to be able to latch onto the female and mate. Um, and so I, I discovered this, and I had no idea there was dimorphism in these guys. And so this was really cool to discover. And then the, the tigriopus, the harpactophoids, you can also do this. But the calanoids, very difficult. So the challenges that we face um, in, in our business and, and many others in aquaculture is with the phytoplankton, with the copepods, there's always the threat of contamination. And I'll talk about how we deal with that. There's seasonality issues. Even with us, you know, we're growing our algae in, in, in Silicon Valley, California. There's, a, there's abundant sunshine year round, very mild climate, almost Mediterranean, great place to grow algae, but not when it rains for two months. Um, and, and you know, this, you guys are probably familiar with what happened in California over the winter. We got like the most rain we've had in, in many, many years. It was absolutely insane. And so our farm was really struggling. Uh, you know, we were just doing, we were doing the stop the rain dance kind of thing. Um, and so weather can just be a problem when you're relying on, you know, natural sunlight. Um, and so, you know, and, and that goes to, you know, where you can grow algae this way. There's only, you know, certain places in the world that you can do this. You know, you're not gonna, you know, have much success in places like Seattle, um, where you don't get a whole lot of sunshine. Um, you know, so you gotta pick your, pick your spots and, and you know, grow, grow some algae. Uh, storage um, can, be, can be an issue. You know, we grow a lot of algae and we have to freeze it and store it and, you know, and, and be able to store it and sell it. So we rely on external um, freezer companies to, to store some of our algae. You know, the same people that work with like produce people. Um, equipment can be challenging, getting the right equipment or inventing your own equipment, uh, which is basically what we've had to do with a lot of our stuff was, you know, how do we solve this problem? Well, let's just invent something to fix it. Um, because there's just, hey, there's no you know, textbook, you know, technical book that you can go by. Okay, do these exact things and you can grow millions of gallons of phytoplankton. You just, it's just not possible. Um, and then life support systems. So yeah, constantly having life support. Uh, we feed a lot of we feed a lot of carbon dioxide to our cultures because uh, you know algae needs carbon. They need to create these long chain fatty acids, all of these things that make them tick. They need carbon, so they get that carbon. They get rid of the oxygen. We we get to you know, benefit from that, um, and and also we have to feed them nutrient and we have to regulate temperature and, and so everything. We basically created our own life support system with all the bells and whistles and our own computer programming. So it's all in house and yeah, it's very unique. Um, and then growing the right thing, you know, like you're working with an animal that's new and novel. What do you feed with it? You know, how do you know what to feed? Um, luckily, a lot of that work's been done, um, but, and, and, you know, a lot of these things are available if you know what you need, but that, that can be difficult as well. Um, and then scaling up. Anytime you scale anything up, it gets just more complicated. And, you know, hiring people can be complicated. Uh, you know, getting somebody to be regimented, doing the same thing every day, paying attention to detail. Uh, predicting things, knowing when something's going wrong. These are very difficult things to come by for people in this business. Um, and, and, you know, and they gotta love it. You really gotta love this kind of thing to deal with this. You, the, the, the requirement of perseverance is, is huge. Uh, because, the, you know, the, uh, yeah, there's like a saying, you say, you, you're not an aquaculturist until you've killed 10,000 fish or something. Something ridiculous like that. And so, yeah, there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of failure. But every failure is a step to, to success. And so that's how we look at it. So we never give up. We, we always find a way. And we don't get mad, we don't throw things. We just immediately go to let's figure it out. So biosecurity, I'll talk about the biosecurity. So we have our good friend Hannibal here. Um, and you know, replacing the word ciliates with people. Ciliates don't always tell you what they're thinking. They just see to it that you don't advance in life. So ciliated protozoans are, are a contaminant that we get in our cultures from time to time. And these are things that are just ubiquitous in nature. We don't even know where the heck they come from. Um, and, and so we really don't like ciliates. Uh, they're really cool. They're really neat. I, I highly recommend you look up videos of Euplotes, um, E-U-P-L-O-T-E-S. Uh, there's videos out there under microscopes. These things are really wild. They look like little animals, but they're not even closely related to animals. Um, and so we do our best to, to, you know, to exclude these things, to minimize that. We also do our best to not cross-contaminate the stuff that we're growing ourselves. 
So, um, so as far as biosecurity goes, we have a biosecurity plan in place. This is what most um, aquaculture facilities have. If they don't, they damn well should have one. They should get one. Um, and so it's, it's basically identifying sources of contamination. So to, to our facility, sources of contamination are rivers, lakes, streams, ocean. Um, uh, going to a, a, another, going to the Monterey Bay Aquarium is that's a source of contamination to us. If you go surfing, fishing, sources of contamination. Then suddenly you're a vector. You're a vector of contamination. You could have, you could be harboring those things under your fingernails, on your hands. You, have, you would have no idea. And then you go to your, you go to work. You put your hand in the tank, or you, you put some phytoplankton in a flask, and you, you got something off your hand into the thing, and you, you ruin your cultures. And so, so we take that very seriously. Uh, we don't even allow anybody into certain parts of the farm. Even certain employees are only allowed to certain areas. So let's say the the rotifer guy that's culturing our live, live feeds rotifer animal. He's not allowed to come into the cocoa pot area. And he and I are not allowed to go into the phytoplankton culture room. And you know, there's just all these important things that we have to really focus on and pay attention to. And we have all of these critical control points that we've identified. You know, we have little hand wash things, and, uh, you know, you can clean boots and stuff like that. Um, and, and so it's all to prevent, you know, contaminants from, to, from bringing us to our needs. Contamination can ruin uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, if you look at the shrimp industry, there's a classic uh, white spot disease was, a, was just wiped out shrimp farms globally. It was, it was devastating um, because people were you know, selling rootstock shrimp, selling larval shrimp all over the world. They were tra trading, exchanging, and they were giving each other this white spot disease. Um, and it just wiped out shrimp farms. And so we learned a lot from that. Uh, and, and we take it very seriously. For that. And then other recommended foods that you know we carry that we like to promote are mysis shrimp, enriched brine shrimp, rotifers. That's the little animal I mentioned. Rotifers are a very common live feed organism used by the clownfish breeders, um, and, and many other marine ornamental breeders use this animal called a rotifer. Uh, we grow them. Uh, we grow billions of them at our facility. We sell them to people that want to grow them. We sell them to people that can't grow enough of them. Um, and so everything from a hobbyist growing them in a bucket to a large scale facility growing them in a thousand gallon tank. We also, we also like to carry eggs. Eggs are a very good source of nutrition, so we have oyster eggs and fish eggs. Uh, and then we also sell cocoa pods that are not alive that are concentrated. And then we'll talk about one more thing that we carry here and then I'll open it up. So TDO, this is something that's very different from the things that we do. So this is a dry food that's being, that's primarily was designed for fit, food fish aquaculture, fit fish aquaculture globally. So this uh, food, which is called Otohimi, it's made in Japan, we buy it from Japan. It's, it's used all over the world uh, in flounder hatcheries, sea bass, sea bream hatcheries, even marine ornamental people are using it. Freshwater uh, breeders are using it for like the, the government state agencies that are, that are doing supplementation of bass, perch, uh, panfish in the United States, walleye, things like that. They're using otohimi in those facilities because it's a very high quality food. Got very, it has very good integrity. It also comes in a variety of sizes for different size fish at different stages of their life. Um, and, and it's just, it, and it's also got krill, squid, fish meal, those are the main components. All those things really equate to good growth rates and a good healthy animal. Um, and so we, we're, we want, we've been wanting to carry a dry food for many years to, to provide something like that to all of those people. And we found Otohimi. So what we did is we took Otohimi and we turned it into TDO, top dressed Otohimi. So what we do is we top dress this pellet or granule with a, uh, a compound called astaxanthin, which is a red carotenoid. Uh, that's very similar to what makes those tigger pods red. It's very similar to what makes flamingos uh, feathers red. Um, and so this compound must come from the diet. Algae, algae produce this compound. There's a freshwater algae called the Hematococcus fluvialis that when you grow it outdoors under intense UV, it, it turns red, blood red, with this, with this carotenoid, and that helps it protect itself from oxygen UV stress. Uh, so, so this is a very powerful compound. It's, it's an antioxidant, it's a pigmentation enhancer. And so we, um, we top dress this pellet with that, and you can see here, here's, here's, a, here's a, a proof, so to speak. So this, this fish on the left, was this was a picture sent to us by a hobbyist. This is the same fish as the one on the right, or just in different you know, positions. No smoke and mirrors here. You can do this yourself, trust me, it's for real. So this guy was, I have no idea what he was feeding his, his purse. And, and you can see there in the middle, that's a wild type clownfish. Just, you, know, you can see the coloration. After feeding TDO for about a month, boom, you get wild type coloration. You get more rich pigmentation. And what's cool about this is the breeders love this too because the females 
that acid xanthan gets passed down vertically into their eggs. And so you get that crop of the <coughs> eggs in there with the developing embryos. And so it's a good thing to be in there. It's, you know, it's very powerful, very powerful stuff. Antioxidants, you know, carotenoids are very good for us too. You, know, you eat blueberries, and carrots, and you get these things. It's really good for you. You can even eat the bottom one. So here's, here's some, you know, eye candy. So here's a guy, Gordon Greenlee, a friend of mine, who got his orange spotted fish to eat TDO, which was absolutely insane. Because um, this is a coral eater, a pretty strict coral eater. Um, but you can, there's certain techniques you can use to get them to this point. This isn't like a fish that came out of the wild and just started to eat pellets. That's incredibly rare for something like this to happen. Um, but it's proof that you know you can do it, and they can just ravenously eat this. Um, here's a video um, that uh, my friend Chad Lawson, who works for BRS, has his own aquaculture company. He's you know target feeding spolies, and this was the first time I'd ever seen anybody using TDO to feed the corals. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. It, you know, they ate it. You know, it's, it's happy and, and now, you know, a lot of people are feeding it to corals. It's, it's becoming a very popular coral food because of all the sizes that are available. And you can see here, this ever turns on, here's another time lapse. And, and this is all like mucus feeding, so, you know, corals, some corals have mucus and they use it to kind of bring things into their mouth. And, and uh, you know, corals have a few different ways that they can eat. And then you can see here garden eels. These are just garden eels that are just picking up TDO as it kind of drips in front of them. And that was, that was pretty surprising to me um, when I saw that. And, and, and there are people that are using it for um, freshwater fish as well, you know, flower horn cichlids. You can really get a really hot red looking flower horn cichlid with this food. And, and there are many other um, uh, freshwater fish that benefit from this. Everything from Central to South American cichlids, to African cichlids, tetras, <coughs> lacostomus. Um, we even have people feeding it to axolotl uh, broodstock, and axolotl, once the babies get big enough, they can eat this. Uh, I, I know a guy who's breeding um, poison dart frogs that feeds it to the tadpoles, and he's like, it's just really good for them. They love it, and they grow really fast with it. And so there's all kinds of uses for it. We've even, my boss even took a, a, a package that was expired and fed it to his chickens, and the, they were producing egg producing chickens, and they cracked the egg, and the yolk was red. It was the acid xanthan right to the egg, boom. And he was blown away by that. He's like, it smelled a little weird, kind of fishy-ish, but, but that was, that was, I was like, cool. And you can also use it as a fertilizer. I know people, I, I put it on my bonsai tree sometimes if we have expired stuff. Now, this is like a, a, a clownfish. For the clownfish breeders, which we sell a lot of product, we, have, we do a lot of support for clownfish breeders. This is something we came up with to kind of give them a guide on how to wean your clownfish off of live feed organisms. And in some cases, you know, the TDOA, the powder, which is essentially the size of rotifer is being used beyond, before metamorphosis, way before they even go through metamorphosis, um, which is really cool. It's really powerful because as clownfish breeders know, and there's some sitting here, you want your, you want your fish off of these damn rotifers as fast as possible. Once they're on the dry food, then it's a game changer. It's way easier. You grow faster, you can feed them other things, you can start moving them around, they're healthy. They grow quickly and then you can get them out, out the door sell them, market. So, so this is something we came up with to kind of give them a, a general guide. And this is more appropriate for Ocellaris and Percula, not necessarily the you know the tomatoes and the clarks and the bull and things like that. We're not sure if this is applicable for them. But it also gives people another idea of what weaning looks like. You don't just suddenly stop feeding rotifers and start feeding the weaning diet. You have to you have to have overflow. And so this just helps you visualize. All right, that's it. <laughs>